OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. Okay, good. So welcome everybody. <clears throat> uh, this session is called Design and Impl Implementation of High Flex Models in Adult Foundational Education. It's a, a name that some of us are using to describe our field, not programs in our field, uh, but it includes, as you might well expect, English uh, for Speakers of Other Languages or ESL, uh, includes um, basic literacy, adult basic education, adult secondary education, and all of the things that you're familiar with. Um, under the title here, you will see a link to the HyFlex guide that we're gonna be talking about today. And uh, essentially what we're gonna to try to do here, uh, the, if you like the objectives, um, are to help participants increase their understanding of what adult foundational education, HyFlex teaching and learning is and what its benefits might be to you as teachers and as administrators and of course to adult learners. Uh, also, you should be able to uh, learn from our presentation today what the guide includes. And finally, you uh, with this link, and I'll have the link again in the last slide, uh, you will have access to the guide so that you can uh, peruse it on your own. So uh, if you haven't gone into the chat, and I hope people in the room can access the chat as well, um, please uh, introduce yourself and uh, answer uh, this question. Uh, tell us if you're new to the field or if you've heard of HyFlex before but don't really know much about it, or you're thinking about starting a HyFlex class, or you actually have been teaching a high flex class or perhaps something else. Okay. Destiny, you want to talk a little bit about this? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Destiny Simpson, and I'm a consultant with the uh, EdTech Center and worked with David and Jen to write the high flex guide. So, one of the things we wanted to do was give you a one shop stop place to get all the resources that you need for today's presentation. So if you're in person, you can use your phone and open up your camera app, scan the QR code that's on there, it'll take you to the website. If you're um, joining us online, you can see in the chat, I typed in a link that has a link to our Padlet. But as we go throughout the presentation today, we're going to refer to the guides and videos, and there's some other resources that are on here. And uh, don't worry about trying to keep track of all of those. Uh, if you access this Padlet, it'll have all the resources that you need. And here's our agenda for today. We're going to give you a brief introduction, very brief. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, some of the possible benefits and uh, HyFlex resources uh, that might be available to you, and also a little bit on teaching and uh, on technology and teaching strategies. And then finally, we hope we'll have a few minutes for uh, questions and closing thoughts. Sorry we got started late. I'm not quite sure why that is. Uh, we were ready, but anyway, uh, we'll try to speed through and give you some time to ask some questions. Jen? Yes, hello everyone. My name is Jen Vanek. I'm Director of Digital Learning and Research at the Ed Tech Center at World Ed. And very happy to be here. Thanks so much for attending this session. Um, so David, Destiny, and I have been thinking about what high flex means for a couple of years now, actually, even before the pandemic started. Um, so we did a little bit of investigating about where this interesting model for delivering instruction comes from. And we found this wonderful seminal work by Dr. Brian Beatty, who's at University of California, San Francisco, who started this with higher ed students as a way to make it possible to reach more students in the manner in which they needed to learn. And we just lost the slides, David. Yep, I saw that. Yeah. Okay, okay. There, there we're back. So when we say high flex, what we mean is high, you can go ahead and go to presenter mode. Mm -hmm. 
We mean um, hybrid, flexible, and the way BD first talked about this was entire courses that were that were built on a hybrid, flexible model. So with hybrid, we mean combining both online and face-to-face -face teaching and learning activities. And with flexible, it means the students actually have agency to make decisions about how they're going to attend class minute by like day by day often in some programs they they ask students to commit a little bit in advance but essentially they are allowed to choose when they come with the idea that there's equivalent instruction happening whether or not they're online okay oh, you can go to the next slide david whether they're online okay and online meaning either synchronous like on a zoom call or online meaning asynchronous like using Moodle or Canvas or something or whether or not they come in person. So again the three modes are in person, synchronous online like real time with the in person classroom or asynchronous online where similar content is covered but students have more control over their pace and timing when they do that work. Uh, next slide please. So what we know is that while hardly any adult ed, not, not zero, but hardly any adult ed programs were thinking about HyFlex before the pandemic, the pandemic made it absolutely critical to provide flexible and technology rich and connection and engagement opportunities in order to maximize the breadth of the, the possible student body that could participate in learning. Um, and what's interesting is because so many programs acquired the technology and the capacity to use those technologies to deliver synchronous online instruction, many realized that how important that was in mitigating barriers to in-person attendance. And we're looking at ways to continue sustainable delivery of a high flex model long after the pandemic. So at this point, I'll pass it off to David, who's gonna give you a little bit more info about Brian Beatty's key values. Thanks, Jen. So there are four underlying principles or key values here. Uh, learner choice equivalency, that is equivalency of mode, reusability, that is reusability of specific learning objects or specific kinds of content, and accessibility. And we'll talk about each of those very briefly. So learner choice, um, this is really a, a key principle here, which is that learners get to choose. And as Jen mentioned, on any given day in many of the HyFlex models and in the, in the design of HyFlex by BD and uh, his graduate students, um, learners get to choose whether they're gonna be in person, online synchronously or asynchronously, and they can change from day to day. They may not. They may choose the mode that they're most interested in and occasionally choose a different mode, or they may switch around quite a bit depending on the needs in their lives. So for example, it could be daily, weekly. It could be by topic. They might say, oh, you know, I really have to be in person for this one. I can't do this remotely. Um, or it could be just this, Choose it by the semester, for example. All of these are possible. So equivalency. Now this is a really important, but very difficult uh, principle to actually embody. And that is that it wouldn't matter which mode a learner chose on any given day. They would have the equivalent that would in content and in approach methods, <clears throat> strategies that would enable to enable them to achieve the same learning objectives. Think about that. That's a tough one, but it's very important in the design. Reusability. So you design an artifact, whatever it might be. It might be a tool. It might be a <clears throat> piece of content. It might be a video. It might be a document, whatever it is. Um, that could be reused in any of the modes. So it becomes a learning object. And so the importance of this from a teacher's perspective, I think, is that it increases the efficiency in designing your high flex model. You can reuse objects. I, here's, a, here's a perfectly good example. In many implementations of high flex, the asynchronous model 
is simply a recording that was made of the simultaneous uh, in-person and online class. And so then it can be used, entirely used by uh, learners who are doing this <clears throat> asynchronously, but it could also be used by learners who were there in person or who were there online and heard and saw everything, but who really wanna go back and review certain parts. So it becomes a learning object. And then finally, learners need to have access. <laughs> we all know that, uh, how important that is. Hot, high bandwidth access is really what we're talking about. And then beyond that, they need to have digital literacy skills to be able to uh, use this. And that needs to be built into the design of the high flex model so that you're sure the, the learners have those skills. So again, three modes, <laughs> equivalent learning outcomes, regardless of which mode a learner chooses on any given day. So Destiny, <clears throat> we're gonna try folks um, to show you uh, just a section of one of the videos that uh, we have in uh, the guide. And Den uh, Destiny, do you wanna talk about that? And yeah. I'm gonna um, stop sharing and I'll enable you to share. I hope. Perfect, thanks. So one of the things we heard from teachers in the field that were new or were um, teachers that were new to the field to high flex or uh, had some experience with it was that they really wanted to see what high flex looked like uh, in the classroom. What does it look like in action? So it's one thing to kind of imagine all three modes happening, but what does it actually look like? So we worked with a teacher in Arizona, her name's Vi Haas, and she's been teaching high flex for about, I think a year at the time this video was filmed. She teaches English language learners and uh, she had about six or eight learners joining online and about, uh, I think, 20 learners in person. So this video, we're just going to show you some snippets of it, um, but the full video is available online on YouTube. And we have a whole playlist of high flex videos that I'll tell you about in a second. But just to give you a little bit of background, these are English language learners who are um, learning about the imperative form and also using sequencing words. So what you'll see is she's setting up an activity where first she's giving directions to her in-person learners, and then she's going to give directions to her online learners. And I just wanted to show you um, kind of what that looks like uh, in an actual class. So I'm going to start. Not on. Destiny, we're not hearing the sound. Okay, let me try this. Um, one here is bread, the butter. Sorry about that. One and spread the jam. Okay. Uh, wait. wait. It's the last one. Eat and enjoy. Eat and enjoy. Okay. And press, press down. Okay. So make sure you write these words down so you remember. So her learners are um, online via Zoom, um, as well as uh, her in-person learners. And now we're going to jump ahead to where she's giving directions for her um, learners about some uh, in-person, the in-person activity they're going to do to practice these skills. You just look at the images, OK? Oh, yes. Look at the pictures. Okay. First, you put the pictures in the correct order, and then on a piece of paper, write down the instructions on how to make toast using these words, okay? But also using the, the sequence words, okay? Like first, okay? Maybe second, next, after that, I'm going to do is kind of jump ahead so you can see how she starts giving directions to her online learners. So for her in-person learners, they had uh, pieces of paper that they used as manipulatives to try to build a story and to um, practice the English language skills. But for her online learners, she set up a jam board for them to be able to use. So let me jump ahead so you can 
uh, listen to how that works. On how to bake toast, okay? These words will online. I'm going to give you a link to the images. You guys will work together to complete the same activity, okay? So, everyone online, can you see these pictures? Yes. Good, okay. These pictures are not in the correct order, <laughs> okay? What you need to do, okay, you can click and drag the pictures in the correct number, okay? So you have number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, okay? So you guys will work together and put the pictures in the correct order, okay? So that's just a little sneak peek of videos that uh, we created, and I'll talk a little bit more about them later on in the presentation. So I'll turn it back over to Jen now. Yeah, could you just keep sharing, Destiny? Uh, yes. Thanks. Just a second here. Great, thank you. So we're gonna spend just a few minutes. Oh, we lost it. There it is. We're gonna talk just a few minutes about the benefits of high flex instruction. Um, but before you hear from us what we've read and seen about the benefits of high flex instruction, I think it would be useful for us to have a conversation um, to hear from you what you think. Um, so if you could, let's just take a minute to reflect um, what do you, on this question, what do you see as potential benefits of high flex classes for your learners, your program, or yourself? So please just honestly take a minute and reflect on this question, and then I'll give you the next prompt. Can you write the comments on the chat? Yeah, okay. I would like you to. Oh, actually, David, I want to if you could just reflect on this for one second, feel free to write it in the chat, but don't hit enter yet. And those of you sitting in the room, just you can just reflect and we'll call on you. Also, Susanna Ramirez asks, uh, can you give us a link to that YouTube video, please? And yes, it's in the guide. There's a whole section with five videos, uh, authentic videos of yeah. adult ed teachers in the classroom. Okay, so um, I hope you've reflected a tiny bit. Now, uh, if you could write in the chat what your benefit is, and then those of you in the room, I guess we'll just rely on Susanna. It's Susanna or who? Melina. Oh, Melina is going to convey information. Okay, so what we're going to do now is called a waterfall chat. And the cool thing about a waterfall chat is that You've all written something in the box, okay, in the chat box, but you're not busy reading each other's things. You're thinking and reflecting. And when I say three, two, one count, when I do the three, two, one countdown, you're going to all hit enter at the same time. So we'll have this waterfall of ideas. Um, it's just a really nice technique to give you all time to actually reflect and not be distracted by what others are putting in the box. It really works well with learners. So how I'll go, are you ready? Ready to, to hit enter? Okay, hit enter, go ahead. Three, two, one. So um, let's just take a peek at some of the online suggestions. Benefits for students with children and no children. Students could not lose instructions for, they don't, yes, if they have barriers, things that come up. Inclusion for students with disabilities. A main benefit would be for the flexibility, hopefully increased persistence and enrollment. They don't get behind benefits for students without transportation. And how about in the room? What other additional benefits or what are some of the things that you were thinking about? Elena, are there people in the room who are going to share? Retention, retention. recruitment and retention. Mm -hmm. Right. Programs look just looking more attractive because <clears throat> students know they have the flexibility to come when they can. 
to attend in person when they can. Any other benefits? A couple of uh, comments in the chat. Absent students don't get behind and it's a benefit for students who don't have transportation. Exactly, yeah. So let's let's go to the next slide. Um, so we, Brian Beatty points out a number of benefits for high flex in, in his book. We interviewed, oh, I think it was like 30 teachers or, or program administrators to find out what they thought about high flex as to inform the 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 guide, and some of the some of the stuff that trickled to the top for reasons why people thought there were benefits to high flex were around attendance and reflection, just as you said, um, course completion, meaning with that persistence, there's and that flexibility, there's persistence, and they'll stay. Um, post testing, I think that assumes it's, you know, post testing is easier than if you're a di just a solely distance learner, um, education student, it's often hard to get those hundred percent distance students to come back in for post testing. And then believe it or not, learner gains are actually maximized when students have some sort of blended aspect to their instruction. Um, students who, who are able to leverage different modalities and, and activities in different mo modes tend to um, have learning gains that surpass those that are either 100% online or 100% in the classroom. So um, while there are a number of challenges, um, we think that there are sufficient benefits that we're excited about it. And um, we're here to answer even more questions. So I will pass it on to Destiny now to talk about some of the evidence base for this work. Right. So as, at this point, like Jen had mentioned, there hasn't been any independent research yet that's really looked at um, outcomes. Our guide includes outcomes that programs have reported. And um, I think as you read them, a lot of them are very compelling uh, to consider high flex as an option for your learners. But uh, we do uh, have found that you know, we're still working on gathering data and looking to see what other people are doing in the field. But throughout the guide, I think you'll find, especially in the vignettes, there's um, evidence that programs have shared where they've really seen an impact from this learning uh, learning method. So at this point, we want to uh, share the resources that we have for you. So uh, there's two new resources that are available that we've worked with adult uh, educators across the country to develop. The first is the HyFlex Guide. And so um, I'll put a link to that in the chat in just a second. We also created the video series. So there's uh, five videos right now that show uh, real teachers uh, teaching in a HyFlex class or giving a tour of their classroom setup and the technology they use. And so we're really excited to be able to share these with the field. So the first uh, resource that I want to talk a little bit about is the HyFlex Guide. So this guide is available online through EdTech Books. Uh, one of the great things about it being online is that you can download it um, either in chapters or in sections and share it with anyone. Um, it's open source and available for you to view at any time. We developed this by interviewing 17 teachers um, and program administrators who are offering HyFlex across the country. And we actually interviewed two programs from California. One's Garden Grove Adult Education Center, and the other was Santa Barbara Community College. One of the things we really tried hard to do, especially since high flex is such an emerging topic um, in our field, is that we tried to include as many examples um, that we could within the guide, as well as share vignettes where we did kind of like a case summary of uh, what programs are doing with our high flex program, what it looked like, what challenges they're seeing, how they address them, um, what benefits they've seen. So this will give you uh, an idea of the table of contents. Uh, we have a chapter dedicated to each of these bullet points here. Um, we talk about program planning, instructional planning, what teaching actually looks like in a high flex class, how programs went about kind of implementing and then scaling up their high flex models. And then we talked a little bit about evaluation, which is still kind of an emerging area for um, high flex and adult uh, foundational education. But we also spent some time uh, looking at hardware and software that people use and have some guidance about that as well. So I'm going to bring up the guide here just so you can see it on the screen. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out are these vignettes. 
each one of these um, kind of sub sub chapters is a, 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 a summary of what's happening at a, an adult basic ed program in uh, across the country. So each has a description of the program learners. It talks about what recruitment and orientation looks like, uh, how they went about planning, delivering instruction, technologies, tech support, um, what data they collected, benefits, challenges. I think there's a lot of great information that can help you think about how you might set up a high flex class or to take pieces, if you already do, pieces of what other people are doing and um, and enhance what you're already doing. So uh, this is the guide that's available and the links in the chat. Um, if you're in person, you can access the guide from uh, the Padlet site, the QR code. And we put that up at the beginning of the session, but we'll also put that up at the end. So you can be sure to access that as well too. So let me go back to the PowerPoint here. The other thing I wanted to point out, and if you're in person, please feel free to uh, access the QR code, uh, is our HyFlex video series. So we created five videos that feature uh, Vihas in four of them and um, Christine Dreeling from uh, Minnesota in the fifth one. Uh, in the first three, uh, Vi is teaching a class, and uh, you get to see how she interacts with her learners, and um, whether they're online or in person or asynchronous. And um, in the last two videos, they're tours of how uh, two programs have set up their HyFlex classrooms. So it's a great way to kind of get a better sense of uh, how people are using technology and not only just the hardware and software of setting things up, but also what, what it looks like in actual teaching. So we're really excited about these videos and um, I can put a link in the chat for the playlist in uh, just a second then too. So uh, we encourage you to watch these videos, um, give us feedback, and uh, we hope that they're a resource as you're exploring HyFlex, training teachers, or um, looking to enhance your program. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Jen, and I'll add the links to the HyFlex videos. Yes, this is just a quick kind of pulse check and check in with you to see how you're all feeling about High Flex now that you've had an overview and a sense of some of the resources that are out there to help you get going. Um, so if for those of you, I noticed um, some of you were, there are a couple of people who are just like going to start teaching High Flex very soon, a little bit of prior experience. Um, for those of you who are new to this idea, what, how, you know, what are you thinking now? I would, we'd love to just have here some of your general observations here on, on whether or not you could actually start using the high flex model. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I just totally went off script. Um, would you be interested? And if you are teaching in high flex now, if you'd be interested in having a high, your, your class featured in a high flex video. So do let us know. Um, also, are there additional video topics you'd be interested in seeing? So this is what we want to hear from you about. If you want to, can uh, let's see, go maybe go back to that previous slide to see the list of videos. Yeah. Do we put it in the chat, the answer to the questions? You can just, uh, if you, you could chat. Yeah, anytime now. We're not going to do waterfall chat. Okay. So um, okay. If you have ideas for other videos, that would be helpful. So you can see we've got engaging learners, setting up the technology, using online assessment in HyFlex, and then the, the classroom tours. What additional videos would be helpful for you? I'd like to see something about um, getting the in-person students collaborating with the online students. OK, interesting. So, right, what activities or engagements make that possible? How asynchronous material is shared with learners. Absolutely, yeah. Really good idea for a video. Video <laughs> troubleshooting issues with sound. Mm, yeah. Other ideas? I'm wondering about multi-level ESL classroom. Great, so a video focus, focusing on differentiating instruction. 
right? If you have different stations and groups that you're working with or that are doing different things, facilitating that with uh, different levels online as well. That's great. Overcoming guess... digital literacy challenges. Oh, yeah. Digital literacy, okay. Supporting digital literacy challenges, great. Videos for the actual students to like an onboarding videos for people so because they need to have some kind of digital literacy too. Yeah. Good. Okay. And is anybody in a, teaching HyFlex right now that would be interested in having your class featured in a video? I'm can, teaching one. Let me see. Yeah, so you should maybe if you're interested, maybe get it into the chat. Um, your maybe your name and organization, and then we can um, try to reach out to you. Perhaps even your email. Okay, I think we can move on to the next slide. Sure. David. Um, <clears throat> uh, actually, um, Destiny, if you can continue, that'd be fine. Uh, Ken Ryan, by the way, asks: Can the in-person learners? be online in the classroom? And the answer is yes, um, if you have the technology for them to do that, if they have access to the internet and if they have a device, absolutely. And, and there are some good examples of that. And maybe we should um, think about doing a video uh, demonstrating that. So thanks yeah, I would say question. the other consideration <laughs> is there is whether or not your program has the bandwidth to sustain that, to support yeah, that. Right. I've heard that as an issue in some places. No, me too. So we want to talk about technology uh, briefly. Again, there's a lot more in the guide itself, but uh, Destiny, next slide, please. <clears throat> so here's the range of possibilities from really basic necessary technology to high-end technology. And you might wonder, well, what are we talking here? Uh, how much is this going to cost our program? So at the basic end, I would say roughly $1,000. In other words, you can do high flex classes with $1,000. But at the high end, you might be talking $25,000. And that provides the kind of technology that makes it really seamless and issues of sound disappear. You can count on having good sound, whoever is speaking, the teacher, the student, whatever. Um, and some of the problems that people have observed with blended learning or with high flex uh, classes um, really are addressed by the expensive technology at this point. We, it is available, many community colleges now use it um, and some school districts use it as well. And we do have examples of that in the guide. Next slide, please, Destiny. <clears throat> So how do you know what technology to use? Well, if you're in the planning stage, and it seems like many of you who have responded are exactly in that stage, here are some of the things you need to consider. Why? Why do you want to use a high flex model? What's the purpose? What do you want to achieve by doing that? You want to think about learners' capacity for remote internet access. You know, if you're in a part of the country which has very little broadband access or none in some cases, it's not a good idea to do this. Um, if you have an uneven amount of uh, access, um, but you have some new funding that might be available, um, perhaps the Digital uh, Equity Act that's uh, about to fund a lot of programs in uh, 2024, um, you know, maybe maybe this is the time to do the planning for it so that a high flex model really would work in 2024. Uh, what existing classroom technology and what existing internet access do you have? Uh, it's a really important question to ask as part of the planning. What's the class size? What are the number of learners that you might anticipate in each mode? And by the way, you can't know. <laughs> That's basically the answer. And you can't know from let's say semester to semester. I've, I've talked to teachers who one semester said everybody was in person. That's what they wanted to do. And then the next semester, um, half of the people wanted to be online. And then the next semester, most people wanted to be online. Um, you know, and it depends on the learner's needs and what, what the capacity is to meet those needs. Learner's digital skills, big issue. 
and what to do about that if they don't have the digital skills needed to effectively use a high flex model. Um, what's your budget? What's your technology budget? Or what could your budget be? And if so, what kinds of, what's the timeline in order to raise that kind of budget? And then finally, and, and we advise everybody to think about this, if you're starting a new high flex program, pilot it first. Don't have all your classes doing it at once because there will be challenges and you wanna, you wanna basically work those out uh, before you scale it up. Next slide, please. So here's, in terms of technology, here's in general what people will need. There will need to be some kind of teacher computer. Could be a laptop, doesn't have to be a desktop. There needs to be a camera that shows the teacher and ideally and or the in-person learners. In other words, being able to show one or the other or simultaneously show them both. You're gonna need some kind of display hardware, a smart board, for example. Uh, to show the in-person learner content. You're gonna need microphones, you're gonna need speakers. And the, I can't underestimate, you, you've already experienced this yourself, probably even so far in the, in the uh, symposium here, which is that sound is the key feature. It often doesn't matter as much whether you can see what's going on, but you have to be able to hear what people are saying. And then finally, you need a good, broadband internet connection, a reliable one and a powerful one. And then for remote learners, they need a device <clears throat> to log in and they need a good broadband internet connection as well. Next slide, please. So this is just a reminder of the five videos, two of them focus on the technology, actual technology that teachers at Pima Community College and at the Hub Center in St. Paul actually use. So if you're in the stage of, oh, we, we need to think seriously about what technology we need to get and we wanna see what other teachers do, here are two videos that will show you that. Next slide, please. So we'd like to just say a little bit about um, an important strategy for thinking about high flex um, BD recommends the place to start is by creating your asynchronous content first. And, you know, he, he suggests doing so by deciding actually by using standards or objectives about what you want to teach as a backbone for shaping all of the instruction and then designing the asynchronous online stuff first, because if you can figure out how to deliver the standards or the content that you want to deliver asynchronously online, then it's easier to, to take that and replicate or create um, equitable learning opportunities that will be delivered synchronously. If you start with synchronously, it's, har it's harder to go the opposite direction. Um, and in fact, we've had, we have, we do do some writing about this. Um, Sarah Wheeler, who is the state director in New Hampshire, has actually been setting up high flex professional learning. And she has taken this approach and does some, we do, we, we share some of her insights about starting with asynchronous first in the handbook. I think next slide. So um, the other thing that you want to consider are the types of technologies that are going to be useful for creating engaging learning opportunities for students. Uh, when we interviewed the, the teachers and the program directors for the, for the guide, these are some of the technologies that popped up as being useful. So nearly everyone had some sort of class website, learning management system, some sort of digital home base where all of the learners, whether or not they were in-person, online synchronous or asynchronous could access content. Then um, they were using very like collaboration opportunities, collaboration and engagement tools. Like I think that video that show, showed Vi using a Jamboard um, so Jamboard's a very popular tool for engaging students online. Um, Google Docs are awesome collaboration tools for co-constructing 
information um, or creating a series of hyperdocs in order to pa pace learners through a learning experience. Um, and that kind of thing could definitely be repurposed as an online asynchronous learning opportunity. Um, Short-term immediate, like quick learning opportunities like Poll Everywhere, Mentimeter, Kahoot, or even quizzes, or then you know using something like Paradeck to support learners following along with presentations or instruction, or even for formative assessment. Um, so I'm sure there are more. If there are other tools that you are using in your high flux instruction, or even in your technology rich in person instruction, I feel free to chat them. Um, and we'd love to explore how they might be useful in a high flex model. Back to you, Destiny. We wanted to share an example of what this looks like from the teacher perspective. So this is an example that we took from the high flex guide um, just to kind of help, especially if you're new to high flex teaching, what does it look like from a teacher perspective? So here's an example of where a teacher is teaching a live class, but the teacher is um, making sure to point out directions for learners that may be in each of the modes. So for example, the teacher says, if you're in the room, I want you to turn to a partner and share what you wrote. Um, for the online learners, I'll assign you to a breakout room and you can work with your partner there. And if you're watching the recording, so for those asynchronous learners, they're not forgotten. They're addressed in the video as well. Press for pause, you know, uh, add your thoughts to the discussion forum and then come back and press play and, and we'll resume class together. So it's just a, a slightly different way of thinking about and making sure that you're including all learners whenever you're giving directions for students. So we tried to include examples like this throughout the guide as much as we could. And we'd love to add more um, either through video videos or through updates to the guide as we go along. So um, this is uh, just some tips that we gathered from the field, just some very general uh, tips that we found. But as David mentioned earlier, you know, start small and with early adopters. Start with the teachers that are very interested in uh, in um, trying out technology that are kind of willing to help troubleshoot and work through the challenges of trying this new, new way of teaching. Um, you know, take your time to identify the best technology. We heard from several programs where um, if the technology that you're using isn't really great, um, as for your online learners, it really can make everything a lot more cumbersome for the teacher and the learners. So finding the right technology tools that provide good sound, good, uh, good video, so that they're able to see was really important. Uh, this was universal with everyone we interviewed. Providing uh, professional development and planning time for teachers is so important. Uh, it takes uh, time to decide and plan how to provide a lesson to learners in all three modalities. And so teachers need training in how to do that. And they also need support uh, um, in planning time to be able to do that. Uh, keep in mind that uh, tech support is going to be needed for both teachers and learners, uh, not only just at the beginning, but throughout class as it goes along. We found that um, learners and teachers got more comfortable as they started using their technology more, but it's important to have a plan for uh, how technology would be provided, tech support would be provided. Um, if possible, to pilot the technology you're buying beforehand. Um, OTAN, I'm pretty sure, has a lending library of some technology you could try out and test. So um, be sure to touch base with um, some OTAN staff. If you're interested in trying out a certain uh, like camera or tool or something like that, they may have access to you uh, to be able to borrow something. Go visit another program that might be doing HyFlex, um, and OTAN would be a great resource for helping you to connect with a local program that could be a resource. And um, as with trying anything new, the, it's always important to expect uncertainty and change. Know that's part of growing and learning um, for the teachers as well as the learners, and to kind of set that expectation that that's going to happen so that whenever you do hit a roadblock, it doesn't feel so um, so. Uh, bad, it's expected, it's part of the learning uh, learning uh, curve of taking on this new way of teaching and that they uh, kind of have, uh, both learners and teachers have a growth mindset as they're adapting this. So, um, you know, uh, going back to 
the benefits and reasons why you might want to consider HyFlex, you all listed a long uh, list of great reasons of why you'd want to um, uh, consider uh, offering HyFlex for your learners. And, you know, ultimately it's, it's for our learners. It provides them a way uh, with their lives uh, to support their learning and um, that uh, it's another way to help learners support their goals, uh, reach their goals. So um, I just wanted to put up the QR code again for the Padlet. I will um, put that in the chat again. So there's links to not only the um, HyFlex guide itself, but also some other resources that may have inter be interest to you, as well as the video uh, series as well. So I'll throw that in the chat right now real quick. And then, um, oops, sorry, I'll do that in just a second. And what I'll do is turn it over now uh, back to Jen to wrap us up. Yeah, so we're really, we're wondering how you're all feeling about this. And you, it seems like the annotation tool is set up here, is it? Can people annotate online? If you can, we would love it if you would just make a little X or indicate how you are feeling about um, HyFlex in this moment. And if you don't want to deal with the annotation tool, feel free to just place something in the chat. Destiny, can you uh, stop sharing? I have a different slide for our last slide. Sure. So please do chat. Oh, I like Matthias. Yeah. <laughs> mixed emotions, complex mixed emotions. <laughs> Well, I hope that after listening to the presentation, you're you're feeling more inclined to try it than than less inclined than when when you came into the room. We really have seen this um, generate lots of excitement around the country, and we've seen many programs who have devoted the resources needed to make their teachers successful. I just want to add that this a shift to high flex cannot be um, a burden borne solely on the instructor, that it really does need to be a programmatic investment. Okay, Ryan has a question. Yeah, sorry, I'm, a, <clears throat> I'm actually the director there at Sweetwater. Sorry, I'm home ill. Um, but I'm really enjoying the session. We're a high flex. Uh, we're trying to high flex as much as we can. I sent, I just wanted to say, I sent a couple questions to Destiny via the chat, and I wanted to see if she could, she might not be checked in on the chat uh, because she's moderating. But, oh, uh, here. So there's a question. Does HyFlex work for beginning ESL classes? No, I asked. I just sent specifically to Destiny because. Oh, I see. Programming. So if uh, she could take a look, or or maybe I can copy paste. But yeah. anyway, the presentation has been fantastic, and I really appreciate yeah. your work. Great. Yeah, Ryan. I think I sent you some uh, direct messages, so uh, we can connect, or uh, feel free to email me after the session. And Susanna, did you have a question or an observation? I do. Um, so this morning, I, I mentioned this before, this this morning, the keynote speaker, it was really hard to hear her. So every time she would turn, I think it was like to the right, you, her voice would go down. Her speaker was right on her, um, I guess her, her left side by her scarf. So I have, I'm concerned about issues like that. I'm, a, I'm wondering if it's just because it was a bigger, room um, or do the teachers experience that kind of issues in the actual classroom? So <clears throat> Susanna, the owl, which I believe is what is used um, in the, in the uh, classrooms in the, this symposium, is not really designed for that. <clears throat> it's designed for small uh, conference rooms. And mm -hmm. the sound is really good in a small conference room. In a large echoey classroom, having only one owl is not um, particularly effective. Uh, there is a way of chaining two owls together that could work, or there's higher end technology. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, an owl is about a thousand dollars. And so you can do high flex classrooms, small ones uh, in non echoey spaces, you can do them well. Uh, but if you have a larger classroom, uh, you probably want to invest in higher end technology. The better sound. 
Mm. Oh, so so for the keynote speaker, you know, I guess moving forward next for next year, maybe the two owls would be better. Possibly, or maybe a different arrangement altogether. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. By the way, how much more time do we have? I'm not clear because we started late. Does anybody know? Uh, the session ends at two o'clock. So okay, so, okay. Well, so it's been it a pleasure. Is. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for everybody for coming and uh, please check out the guide and you have our email addresses on this slide. Uh, you can note those and uh, we'd be glad to hear from you. Um, I hope the uh, symposium goes well for you. <laughs>